thanks a lot, Mike, for this introduction. And uh, uh, I'm very happy to be here. And from the name of German professors of HES, I am happy to be your next guide on this virtual tour of our institute. And I'd like to share with you some of the ideas uh, which play a role in my research. And actually in research of many physicists because this concept of universality in my title it is one of the central concepts in physics. So in this talk, I'll, I will explain to you what the physicists mean by universality, because we have a somewhat technical meaning for this term, which is maybe not exactly the same as in everyday life. I'll show you a few examples where this universality can be seen in concrete physical systems. And we will also see a few of, uh, remaining puzzles that I'm trying to address in my research. So this is probably a very diverse audience, but I hope that there's going to be something for everyone's intellectual curiosity. So let me tell you what universality is. In physics, we often have to deal with complicated systems which have many parts and also many parameters characterizing these parts and how they are connected to each other. So you might think that because the system is so complicated, any theory, any theoretical description of the system is going to be as complicated as the system itself. But actually, more often than not, it turns out to be the other way around. The system is complicated, but uh, there's going to be emerging some equations, some general laws, which are, first of all, uh, relatively simple. And second, they have relatively few parameters compared to the total number of parameters characterizing the system. And moreover, this, this general laws, they're going to be uh, often universal, meaning that they're going to be many different systems characterized by the same general equations. So uh, universality in physics is basically all what I just said. So to, uh, to summarize by universality, we mean emergence of simple and general laws in a priori complicated looking systems, which is accompanied by a reduction in the number of relevant parameters. And maybe as a caveat, I should add that, of course, not everything is going to be universal, that there's always going to be some tiny little details which will depend on the system, but the most important things, they are usually universal. Okay, so this, this is probably rather abstract. This is just the definition, but uh, in now I'm going to show you some examples, some concrete examples of physics systems where this universality, as I described it to you, is realized. And, you know, a common feature of these examples is going to be that uh, of the systems is that they will be made out of many particles, many parts in chaotic motion. So my first example is a liquid. So what is a liquid? A liquid is made of many molecules in chaotic motion. So they're bouncing off each other. They're somewhat densely packed in this box. And 
um, in this movie, in this idealized movie, all molecules have uh, a round idealized shape. But of course, in real liquids, the molecules are not round balls. They can have a complicated shape. Uh, but what's going to happen is that the shape of the molecules is not going to be important for how the liquid behaves. So this is going to be my example of universality. But uh, to see how this happens in more detail, I'll, I would like to consider uh, this universality in liquid flows. So I wish to take this liquid and I wish to put it in a pipe. So I apply a pressure and so the liquid starts flowing. So it, it would have been very difficult to describe the flow of a liquid if I had to follow every molecule with its chaotic behavior. So in order to simplify, I'm going to introduce average velocity. So what this means is that I'm, I'm going to take a small volume surrounding a point. So this volume has to be uh, rather small compared to the diameter of the pipe, but it has to be still rather large so that it contains sufficiently many molecules. And the average velocity is uh, a mean velocity of all molecules in this in this little volume. Now, in terms uh, of if I have to follow every molecule individually, then, and then it's complicated. But in terms of this average velocity, the uh, the flow of the liquid in the pipe behaves much more regularly, much nicer. I have a regular velocity field. I have. Uh, the velocity is maximal in the center of the pipe, then it gradually decreases to the sides of the pipe because of the friction of the liquid against the walls. So it looks much nicer. Of course, uh, this is a, is a very idealized, very regular flow. So if I consider a more realistic flow, then, like in this movie over here, the velocity is going to have some non-trivial dependence on, on space, on coordinates, and also on time. Uh, but what is important is that in any liquid, the dependence of the velocity can be computed, can be calculated by using just one equation. It's called Navier-Stokes equation. So I wrote it here. I'm not going to explain all the terms in this equation. Uh, you see here some derivatives of the velocity. You see derivatives of the pressure. But what is important for my story is that in this equation, there are only two parameters. There is the density of the liquid, rho, and there is the viscosity of the liquid, eta. So you see, the liquid was very complicated, but for all liquids, I have exactly the same equation with just two parameters. That, that, this, that this is possible oh. is a manifestation of universality. Okay, bye. So, uh, so now, okay, now you're probably starting to see uh, the meaning of this concept of universality and why it is powerful. But perhaps some of you are not very uh, surprised because after all, liquid flows are not so esoteric. And you know, I imagine many people are familiar with them. Well, perhaps uh, you will find then my next example uh, more interesting more unexpected. So in, in this example of liquid, we have an equation which contains two parameters. But now I would like to discuss something 
which one can call total universality. It means that there's going to be no free parameters at all. And so this is something that I'm uh, quite interested in and it's something that I'm working on. And uh, this uh, total universality is going to be realized uh, in magnets. I'm going to show you as, as my next example. And uh, magnets, the inner workings of magnets are probably not as widely known as for liquids. So I'm going to spend a few slides so that we can develop some intuition. So in a, to begin with, the, at the very basic level, a magnet can be thought about as a bunch of arrows, uh, which represent the magnetic field of each individual atom. And these arrows, they can point, so this magnetic field of individual atom, it can have two directions, up or down. And uh, the attractive force of the magnet appears if all of these arrows point in one direction. So as here I, I showed, uh, most of the arrows point up, so I painted my magnet red. Now, if if you take, uh, if you look at uh, these arrows and you look at two arrows which are right next to each other, then it turns out that if these arrows are misaligned, if they point in the opposite directions, then there is an aligning force that tries to align them in the same direction. So if you ever held little bar magnets in your hands, then you felt this force, you certainly felt this force. So since every pair, every neighboring pair of arrows tries to be aligned, then you can imagine that basically all arrows in the magnet are going to point in the same direction. And then you would get a very strong magnet. So this, this is the kind of magnet that would attract other things and you can attach it to your uh, fridge door. Uh, so this is a real magnet. But actually it turns out that this does not always happen. And the reason being is that here we are ignoring the effects of the temperature. So let me explain that. The effects under the effects of the temperature, you can think of the temperature as causing uh, some sort of random kicks to every little arrow under the effect of these kicks, the arrows vibrate. So here in this picture, the arrows vibrate, but they still point mostly in the same direction. But actually, uh, from time to time, what's going to happen is that uh, there are going to be two arrows which are aligned, but they will get a rather violent random thermal kick, which will disalign them. And so you, you see you have two effects. You have the effect of the aligning force, which tries to take the misaligned arrows and align them. And you also have this random thermal kicks, which can reverse this process and, and point the arrows in the opposite direction. And so uh, because of this random kicks, uh, if you take a, a real magnet, even at a normal temperature, uh, you will see that uh, most of the arrows are going to be pointing in one direction, but there are going to be some random flips. So from time to time, this or that arrow will flip down, then it will flip back up. So uh, 
so this is still a good magnet. This magnet still attracts things because most of the arrows are still pointing in one direction. But now, as we increase the temperature, these thermal kicks get more, more and more violent. And then under the effects of this thermal kicks, the directions of the arrows is going to be completely randomized. So when, when this happens, then uh, this, this magnet is going to lose its ability to attract things because basically half of the arrows is pointing up and half of the arrows is pointing down. So th this kind of magnet is going to fall off your fridge door. So basically at, uh, at sufficiently high temperature, magnets stop working. And so j just to summarize what I just said, because of this uh, random thermal kicks, the magnets, they gradually lose uh, their strength. They become weaker and weaker. And then at, at some temperature, they, they lose all of its strength. So the strength just disappears and the magnet is no longer a magnet. So I, I call this temperature in this talk of course, in physics, we call it differently, but in this talk, I will call it fridge fall off temperature. And this temperature is, is important for my story because it is at this fridge fall off temperature that total, this total universality that I mentioned is going to take place. But, you know, uh, what's, What's gonna happen at this fridge full of temperature? And it's kind of hard, it's kind of easy to understand that uh, the magnet at this fridge full of temperature is going to look, uh, is going to be very complicated. Uh, and, you know, if you took an electronic microscope and if you looked at this magnet and if you managed to make a movie then you would see something like this so in this movie i uh, i see uh, you know arrows up are painted black and arrows down are painted white and you see that there are you know since there the at this fridge full of temperature the effect of the aligning force and the thermal kicks, they basically almost essentially compensate each other. You see that, that there is this very uh, complicated dance of uh, islands of arrows up, surrounded by arrows down, then again, arrows up. So I, I actually personally find it quite beautiful and uh, even mesmerizing you can call it fractal you can call it many other words uh, but but let me tell you where this total universality enters this picture actually it it enters it in um, in very many ways but in this talk i'm going to sh just show you uh, one way. So uh, let's let's do this thought experiment. Let's look at two arrows separated by some distance in this soup of fluctuating arrows. So these these arrows are of course uh, constantly flipping up and down okay here i painted them both red but they're constantly flipping up and down so part of the time they are going to be aligned part of the time they're going to be disaligned so let let me ask what is the probability uh, that i look at these two arrows and i find them aligned so probability basically means fraction of time 
that these two arrows are going to be aligned. So this is going to be, this probability to find these two arrows aligned is going to be some function of the distance between the arrows. What is this function? So let us think a little bit. You take uh, two nearby arrows, two neighboring arrows, they try to influence each other. Now, that neighboring arrow is going to influence its neighbor and so on. So clearly, after many, many steps, if you take two arrows far away from each other, uh, such two arrows, they feel each other, but they, they don't feel each other very much. So which means that if you look at two distant arrows, the probability that you will find them aligned is going to be very small. So this function uh, that, that we are trying to find is going to be a decreasing function of the distance. That much you can guess without doing any computation. But what is the shape of this function? Now, it turns out that if you take a magnet and if you put it precisely at the fridge hole of temperature, then this function, this probability, takes a very simple form. It's one over the distance between these two arrows to some power, call it x. And this power x, this number, it's a particular number, it's the same for all magnets. So this number is totally universal. So this is what I uh, mean. This, so this, the, the fact that this number x is the same for all magnets is a manifestation of this total universality that I'm, I'm talking about. <clears throat> so, what do we know about this number x? Actually, um, we know it with good precision, but not yet exactly. So, we know that this number x equals 1.03629 dot dot dot. We would like to know more, but that's as much as we know today. So you might say, if we don't know this number x exactly, how do we know that it's universal? Good question. We know that this number is universal because we know that this number is a solution of a universal equation. So recall that for liquids, we had the Navier-Stokes equation, which had two free parameters, uh, density and viscosity. So this equation, which is called conformal bootstrap equation, it's totally universal. It has no free parameters. And okay, I, I put this equation here on the slide for purely aesthetic purposes. So I, there's no way I can explain this equation in this talk. It would take a separate seminar to do this. Um, but you know, every important equation has some beauty to it. So I, just for this beauty, I put it on, on the slide. Um, so unfortunately, we don't know uh, yet how to solve this equation exactly. But you know, in the last 10 years, thanks in particular to my work, we know that this equation exists and we know, you know, we, we know how to solve it approximately at least. And by doing so, uh, we managed to compute this number X with some good accuracy. So hopefully in the future, someone will be able to solve this equation exactly but you know uh, there may be something else that that probably is surprising you here 
because magnets are known, of course, since time immemorial. So how is it possible that this number X has only been computed in the last 10 years? So there is some interesting history here. Actually, uh, as a matter of fact, there is another uh, famous method called renormalization group, uh, which can also compute this number X. And uh, for this method, an American physicist, Ken Wilson, got a Nobel Prize already back in 1982. So it's so this renormalization group method is an older method. It's uh, older than this uh, new, newer conformal bootstrap method that I'm working on. But this um, method is less precise. So it turns out that the conformal bootstrap method computes this number X with better accuracy. So I'm mostly working on, on, on the conformal bootstrap method, but I'm also quite curious about this organization group idea, and I'm also trying to understand uh, how can it perhaps be improved and be made more precise. But in general, I think it's it's quite exciting that there are these two different complementary points of view on on the same problem of total universality, which are actually quite different if you look in the details, very, very, very different, uh, orthogonal almost. Uh, which can compute the same number and which can always, and which can also explain universality, but from two different points of view. So it's quite, quite, uh, I find it quite exciting. So uh, basically I'm, I'm at the end of my talk. So if you have to remember just one thing from my talk, then please remember this, that magnets falling off the fridge are totally universal. Um, uh, but on a on a more uh, serious note, perhaps uh, this phenomenon of total universality that I explained to you using the example of magnets, it is believed to play a role in many other unsolved. Uh, problems in physics, actually some of them quite famous. I give here just two problems. There's a problem of turbulence and there is a problem of high temperature superconductivity. And so I, I'm hoping that these methods and these ideas that I've been developing uh, in the conformal bootstrap and in total universality in general, that they will one day also be used for solving uh, not only magnets, but also these other interesting physics systems. Thank you. Thanks, Lava. That was, that was a great talk. Uh, we have opened the uh, floor to questions. There's uh, the, uh, both the uh, Q&A slot and the uh, chat slot. Uh, it's, it's, it's mentioned by a participant that uh, ITER has uh, important use of uh, magnets. Of course, magnets have, you know, infinite number of, of uses in modern uh, technology. Uh, it could be questions for uh, Slava or for Emmanuel, Jim, uh, you know, any of us. Uh, uh, while we're waiting for a question from the uh, audience, uh, let me uh, ask you a question, uh, Slava, which is uh, perhaps as uh, starting in, 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 in math and uh, you know, continuing in physics, you, you particularly, your point of view is interesting. W would you try or where would you try to draw a line between mathematics and physics? And so if we refer to your talk, the, uh, you, I, I counted three equations in your talk. And uh, I think uh, the Navier-Stokes equation and the uh, power law decay are, are physics. Now, if someone asked you whether the conformal bootstrap was a physics equation or a math equation or both, would you, how would you answer them? Mm. But, you know, I, I don't think um, 
the, the dividing line is so sharp, not definitely not for me. So in um, the equation is an equation. It's, it belongs equally to physics and math. Uh, mathematics may be interested in, in uh, analyzing some aspects of the equation while physics may be interested in, in understanding other aspects of the equation. Mathematicians are usually, uh, so physicists and mathematicians typically analyze the same equation, but physicists, when they see an equation, their first uh, thought is to try to compute something to get the numbers out of this equation. While mathematicians, when they look at the equation, they uh, maybe try to understand if, if this equation has a solution, if its equation is well-defined. Uh, take, for example, the, the Navier-Stokes equation is a famous mathematics problem, uh, which is to understand whether the solutions of the Navier-Stokes equation are globally uh, mathematically well-defined and smooth functions. So uh, th th this is considered to be a major problem in mathematics and it is, but for practicing physicists, uh, it, um, it does not necessarily strike as a particularly urgent, uh, as a particularly urgent problem because um, whether they are or they are not well defined, it does not seem to translate into immediate practical consequences, meaning that physically observable consequences. So uh, the bootstrap equation, it, it, is, um, uh, it does have observable consequences. So in, in this sense, it belongs to the physics realm, uh, but it, it also has very similar features to many equations studied in mathematics. So I hope it will appeal also to mathematicians by its beauty and some structure. So, yeah. Okay. I don't well, claim it. Yeah. Right, right. Very good. So, so the, the, the difference is less the equation than the, the questions it prompts us to ask and the, our interest in the questions. Uh, there were a couple of uh, comment slash uh, question, a question about whether universality has to do really primarily with uh, normalization and perhaps quantum and statistical aspects, or is it more general? Uh, Dennis Sullivan points out that there's university and universality in the population dynamics as studied by uh, Feigenbaum, who even worked at IHES. Uh, can you perhaps name other uh, scientific contexts where a similar universality would appear? Oh, these are, these are both great questions. So uh, in fact, uh, um... Uh, I, both of my examples of university, they were uh, statistical physics uh, in, in origin, they were uh, thermal fluctuations at play, but quantum mechanics is also a source of fluctuations and uh, th these quantum fluctuations, they are in many aspects similar to the thermal fluctuations. And in fact, university plays a role in, in quantum systems as well. Uh, for example, in particle physics, uh, which is a quantum system par excellence, it's um, uh, in the vacuum of quantum field theories, this university is, is, a, is very much at place. So it's important there as well. Uh, as to the second question uh, from, from uh, Dennis Sullivan, it's, uh, it's a great question. Indeed, this Feigenbaum University in um, uh, in dynamical systems, which has been studied by IHS professor Oscar Lanford III in the 80s, who did some important work on it. It's, uh, for me, it's very, it's very inspiring because this university, in Fagibar University, uh, has been understood by organization group methods, uh, organization group ideas of Ken Wilson. But in that particular case, uh, the mathematicians, they managed to obtain very uh, precise, excellent results 
which we do not yet have as physicists applying the ideas of Ken Wilson, say, to magnets. So I'm personally trying to understand why is it that uh, in that field of mathematics, the organization group works much better than in physics where it was born. And I, I'm hoping that, uh, that uh, some improvements can be made. Okay, uh, very good. Uh, let me uh, continue a bit on the previous uh, question. So this was about uh, magnets and uh, ITER. And I, I, I understand the sensitive question perhaps as uh, ITER in, in many applications, uh, one has superconducting magnets, which are have to be kept at very low temperature. Does, does the sort of uh, theoretical work that you and others are thinking about help us to understand whether magnets might uh, become superconducting at higher temperature, help us in solving these practical problems? Uh, would, would you like me to comment? Oh, uh, yeah, brief comment, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so there is this uh, nagging problem with uh, high TC magnets that uh, nobody basically understands the mechanism be behind high TC superconductivity. Uh, and because of this, we don't actually know what is, um, what is the limit to high TC superconductivity. So people stumbled on high TC superconductivity by chance. But unlike for more conventional superconductivity where we know how it works, hence we know its limits, we don't know. So perhaps there exists some much better materials, high TC superconductors, which could have enormous practical applications, but until we know the mechanism, so you can either like guess what is what is materials, but people were trying to guess and didn't manage, but you could try to understand what the mechanism is. And uh, so people believe that, um, uh, that uh, behind the, 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 the properties of high TC superconductors, there, there exists some critical point, which is what I call total universality in my talk. And, but this is very uh, mysterious and nobody knows yet what is, like there's no good theory for this critical point, quantum critical point. So, well, I don't know. I, yeah, I'm not an expert on okay. this, so I don't know if my methods can help, but I also, there's no reason why they might not help. So I hope okay. they will. Oh, that's, a, that's right, it's a, it's a hard question. A question from uh, Leon Peshkin to you. Do you feel that biology has uh, different laws, either uh, they escape universality or uh, perhaps there's a different concept of universality in biology? Hmm. Thanks, Leon, for this question. So it's um, I'm I'm not um, yeah I'm I'm quite ignorant actually about biology, but I know that, but at least some uh, situations, if not in biology but in population dynamics, uh, where universality does play a role. <laughs> These are a bit of exotic situations. So if you look at some uh, plague epidemics for rats in uh, in Kazakhstan, then it turns out that uh, the population of rats in Kazakhstan, it's governed by some universal laws of uh, percolation dynamics, which are very similar to the laws of magnets that I described. As to you know, bio biologists nowadays, they they think about uh, very exciting problems of life and aging and uh, and consciousness for those things i'm i don't know i don't know if university plays a role there okay uh, thanks